Welcome to the Leo Training Podcast with Joe DeLeo. You'll hear in-depth interviews and tips from world-class athletes, coaches, and industry-leading experts to help you train smarter and improve at what you love to do. Train smarter, get stronger, move better, race faster. Here's your host, Joe DeLeo. Hey, 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 I'm back after an extended hiatus. I'm pleased to present a brand new episode of the Leo Training Podcast, and my guest is Brett Bartholomew. Brett is a strength and conditioning coach, author, adjunct professor, and founder of the performance coaching and consulting company, The Bridge Human Performance, as well as the coach education platform, artofcoaching.com. His experience includes working with athletes both in the team environment and private sector, along with members of the United States Special Forces and members of Fortune 500 companies. Taken together, Brett has coached a diverse range of athletes from across 23 sports worldwide at levels ranging from youth athletes to Olympians. He supported numerous Super Bowl and World Series champions, along with several professional fighters in both professional boxing as well as the UFC. From a philanthropic standpoint, Brett serves as the vice president for the nonprofit organization Movement to Be, which serves youth in underprivileged communities through helping them learn more about physical activity. His book, Conscious Coaching, The Art and Science of Building Buy-In, achieved Amazon bestseller status in the categories of sport coaching, ranked number one, Business and Money ranked number eight and was ranked in the Amazon Top 100 Books overall in 2017. It's currently being used by several universities as source material used to help guide future coaches and professionals. Here are three things that you will learn in this episode. One, how to connect with your athletes and clients and drive success in their sport. Two, why relationships are the key to success in coaching. And three, What is Brett's favorite archetype to coach? Without further ado, let's roll to episode 102, The Art of Coaching with Brett Bartholomew. I'm absolutely thrilled to welcome on best-selling author of the book, Conscious Coaching, and he is launching his brand new online course, Bought In. My guest is Brett Bartholomew. Brett, welcome to the Leo Training Podcast. Thanks, Joe. Appreciate it. You, uh, I have to say, out of anybody I've ever been on a podcast with, you are the most like very persistent, very professional, and, and very easy to get this thing organized with. So thank you. I appreciate that. Thanks. Uh, you've uh, been on some some good podcasts, um, people that I follow. So that's a, that's a great compliment. Appreciate that. So let's get right into it. Uh, you have had probably a very, very busy last 18 months with the launch of your book. Uh, it is going to become a bestseller, and then your your courses is, is launching uh, right now. We're in the middle of the launch. Um, so, you know, the first kind of uh, discussion point, I think, that, that I had down here um, was one that you had from the book, uh, and, I, and I cited it on page 24, and it's that the details of our professional paths may provide others with information, but it's the details of our personal journeys outside of the, the weight room that provide insight to our true origins and coaching identities. So my question for you is, why do you, what do you want people to know about your origin and your identity that has helped shape your personal journey today? Yeah, I don't think it's so much about me as it is the core of the message with that is that most people don't know how to identify their coaching style. Uh, you have coaches that by and large develop their coaching style one of two ways, either by mimicking a past mentor or by coaching the same way they were coached. Uh, And I don't think a lot of people in general really know who they are and what they're about and what they believe in because they've gotten so used to the rhetoric (laughs) um, and giving socially acceptable answers such as, oh, I'm in this to make a difference or I do this because it's all about the athletes or I do this. Like that's all great. And it's true for most people, I'm sure. And but it's fairly superficial and that like does it help them excavate more about what they're about, right? So I knew that very clearly I had two interests. One, human performance and and figuring out what it took to push that to its peak. And then two, helping people overcome self-imposed obstacles. And that happened because uh, of a hospitalization that I went through when I was younger. Um, If anybody hasn't read the book yet, you can check it out on Amazon or consciouscoachingbook.com. 
it's about a chapter in and of itself. So I won't go too much into that here. Uh, but yeah, it just goes to, you really need to know who you are and what you're about. If you hope to be able to establish a credible and authentic and effective coaching personality. Absolutely. And, and I think, uh, some of the, uh, words that you finished up with, with there are, are very, uh, key, uh, authentic, um, and developing your kind of your own personal, uh, coaching personality, right? Um, yeah. You know, that's, that's super important to make that emotional connection to the person that you're working with. Um, which actually is a great kind of tie into, to the next, uh, question that I had down. So, why is it so critical that as coaches, we have to remember to take the mindset of people first, athletes second? I think it's just easy to it's easy to get caught up in uh, the love of training, the love of the sport, the love of the science, the love of all those things as it pertains to physical adaptation and all the unique things that are capable through that. It's really easy to fall in love with technology and look at people on iPhones look at people and any kind of tech today, right? They're glued to it. Uh, so people first just means simple that that's the end user. And at the end of the day, none of the greatest uh, equipment or, or even your, the greatest programming in the world is going to help you if you don't know how to connect and relate to and, and build trust. Uh, that's why psychology and sociology departments exist around the world, right? And so I think a lot of people forget about that and they don't know how to operationalize it, which is a big reason I created the course is, you know, by and large, if you want to learn more about trust, communication, social science, you know, on one end of the spectrum, the majority of coaching books are all about like accountability and looking somebody in the eye and strong values and culture, which is great. But that doesn't necessarily help people understand the role of human interaction and what to do when things go wrong, right? What to do when things don't go the way that you read them in a leader about them in a leadership book. Uh, and it, on the other end is, you know, academic journals that oftentimes people don't have access to or if they do, it's so esoteric that they can't make sense of it. So I wanted to create a book that was a funnel and, and something that allowed me to take the research. I think there's 150 articles in the course and, and probably 84 resources in the book and funnel it down to a way that was science plus stories. So it didn't talk over anybody's head um, because nobody likes that. I mean, I, we've all read those books and, and you want to fall asleep after about two paragraphs. But at the same time, didn't dumb it down and disrespect the science, you know, and spoke to a broader audience. <clears throat> right. Yeah. And and I got to imagine during the writing process, that was extremely challenging is kind of trying to toe that line between having like really good, you know, uh, resources that you're that you're pulling from, but also making it very kind of fluid um, and and digestible as you're. Yeah, writing. for sure. I mean. Yeah, it, that, that's always tough for me in terms of uh, I always want to go all in on, on things. And I feel like that's like my one shot. I don't know if I'm ever going to do that. And at the time, I didn't know about the, I was going to do the course right at that time. Like I was just trying to get the book done. And uh, the book was originally, I think, 80 to 85 more pages and, and probably about 42 more references. And my editor finally told me, hey, like, cut it, dude. You know, you can go you can go. And so, you know, it was probably six months after that where I started getting people that wanted to dive even more deeply. So I started a year long process of crafting together the course that is bought in now on artofcoaching.com. Um, and so we've created and it, it's been great. So people read the book and it, it fits, you know, some audiences. That's that's enough for them. You know, they feel like, OK, I've got to I've got to work on this for a while. I've got to really master it and hone it. Then once they're done, you know, them and the other audience that kind of want to dive more deeply have a way to continue that now, at least for the next. Yeah, I mean, the course closes in two days. We'll do another launch in probably July of 2019. Uh, but right now it's like about 500 coaches in there. And, and so it's cool to see them take concepts of the book and run farther with it. Wow. Well, that's incredible, man. Congratulations uh, on people uh, signing up for the course. We still got, like you said, 48 hours to go. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no. Hopefully, I'm I'm more worried about whether they like it and whether they find value in it. You know, and like I, it, that's that's the main thing. But we put a lot of time into it. I mean, I've got a lot of gray in my beard from that. So, <laughs> so you uh, you really got a lot of feedback after the launch of the book, which kind of you know drove you to creating that course. It sounds like people were reaching out to you and saying, "Okay, well, how do we, like you said, take this this further?" Um, is, is part of the reason that you were launching it this year and then you're going to do, you know, kind of the next go around for it is a year later is just to give a lot of time for kind of all that information to soak in, but also so you can um, iterate and make the course better. 
Well, to a degree, but we already did. So we already did a launch in May. Um, was it May or April? We did a launch earlier this year already. And so then we close it. Yeah, because we want to keep the cohort pretty small because we do weekly live Facebook calls and there's a lot of interaction within the five weeks that the course goes on uh, and they get lifetime access to the course. So once they buy it or sign up, it's theirs forever. But for the first five weeks, uh, we really go through a lot of live in-depth calls going through all the because the course is built out into a five week action plan. So that's the significance of the five weeks. So we try not to do more than two launches a year. I mean, one, just because my full time job is a coach Two, you know, we want to make sure that the, the interaction is really high level and that the support can be there. It's the same reason, you know, a university professor wouldn't really love to teach at a lecture hall of 1000 people. Right. It starts to get lost in between. And and this isn't a course that people are meant to just buy and mindlessly consume. It comes with two field guides, which are manuals that help you put everything into play archetype kind of cheat sheet and breakdown from the book. Uh, that was something we got asked for a lot. Like, can you put together a PDF for that? So we did that. Um, and then it dives a lot more deeply into topics that weren't discussed in the book. So uh, specifically, there's a gentleman out of the University of Albany that's done some great research on influence tactics and persuasive communication. So the course really teaches people how to target that. Um, and I don't know when this will air, but even when the course closes, if people go to artofcoaching.com, you'll be able to download, I think it's a 12 minute video that discusses some of those influence tactics. So either way, no matter when you're listening to this, uh, artofcoaching.com will have a sample of that. Well, that's fantastic. And I'll make sure to include that in the show notes for everybody. I yeah, appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah, man. Absolutely. Um, so the next, the next question that I had in here, um, kind of circling back into conscious coaching. Uh, is why is conflict management and not conflict itself usually the problem? And what tools can coaches employ to strengthen this skill set? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. Conflict is inevitable in, in human interaction. We're social creatures. And, and so everybody's bound to uh, misspeak uh, or get their feelings hurt. You know, we're very insecure, sensitive, ego driven animals. Even the most sophisticated of us sometimes the most sophisticated of us have the largest ego, right? And so um, I, I think a lot of people shy away from conflict. They shy away from, uh, you know, telling people like it is and being honest because they feel like it's always going to hurt somebody's feeling. And let's face it, we live in a really politically correct world now, you know, like kids that come in third, third place are now called the third winner, you know, and it's like, that you, you need to ask yourself, does that really prepare people for the realities of the world and, and interpersonal communication as it exists on every level? So uh, I don't think conflict is an issue. I think through chaos comes clarity. And, you know, I always say that you have to cross more wires to create more sparks. I think it's people knowing how to manage that conflict and steer it in a mutual direction with a common goal, vision, path and, and clear set of outcomes that are beneficial to both parties is really what people need to focus on. That's great. Yeah. And, and you lay out some of those tools in the book and then even more in depth through the course. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So I was curious. So what, what led you to come up with the different archetypes? Like what you sat back and kind of, did you have an epiphany or somebody said you should, you know, um, come up with some names and, and personalities kind of attached to these different. No, I'm just, I'm just kind of a weirdo. And, you know, I watch people, I observe people. I've always been interested in how people interact with groups, you know, that's, that's sociology. And, and, you know, there's a, there's a great book called the presentation of self in everyday life, where I think it's written in the 1950s. Um, Goffman, the, the author talks that, you know, no matter who you are, people always kind of put on performances throughout their life. Um, whether that's you getting dressed up before a nice dinner, uh, whether that's a coach, you know, working out to make sure they look the part, whether that's an athlete making sure their Nike or Under Armour apparel or whatever matches, people will put on performances to manage the self image and, and kind of show people the version of themselves that they want others to see. Uh, so, you know, I sat back and looked at that and I wanted to find a way that was a quick heuristic, certainly not a defining, um, not a defining judgment or label, but a quick heuristic to see common interactions, associations. I think the tricky thing about the archetypes uh, is for the reader that doesn't discern, you know, a little bit more deeply, there's a lot of coaches you know, and I had people ask me this is, you know, great. Well, how do we coach every archetype? And that's not really that simple, right? Because somebody can be an archetype in one situation, uh, a certain archetype in one situation and then another, they can be very different, right? So 
when I go speak or present or, or do these, I'm, I'm fairly uh, charismatic. You know, I'm, I'm extroverted. I want to make sure I give people the most value that they can get from the information. Uh, but when I'm not doing these things, I'm fairly introverted and I just kind of like to be left alone. Right. So that's an example. And then another, telling him another coach who asked that same question that, you know, culturally there are differences as well. So a lot of times coaches may think somebody is a certain archetype. Uh, but if that coach isn't self-aware themselves, you know, they're more than likely to apply a judgment or a label as opposed to a, a fairly accurate or rational kind of uh, jump off point or starting point. But archetypes exist in everyday life, right? So you see it on Facebook, you see it on Instagram. There's somebody that's always posting pictures of their food, somebody that's always pic posting pictures of travel, somebody that's always um, on a political rant or, or posting pictures of their cat. These are all examples of archetypical behavior. You see them in the movies as well, the hero, the villain, you know, all those things. So it exists. It's a natural thing. So why not discuss it? Yes. And, and I think that was uh, a great way. The, I love some of the names you you came up with. Like you had some comic book ones in there. The Wolverine comes to That's mind. my favorite one. That's me right there. Yeah. Um, that's cool. So I, I think that's a good way too because um, – it's really easy as a, as the reader, as I was going through to kind of wrap your head around who are those archetypes and, and what are some of the characteristics that they have. Um, so I thought you did a great, great job with that. So appreciate that. You're welcome. So my question for you is, hold on one sec. I got a question for you. Okay. How have you, put, how have you put that information to use in your practice? You know, for your listeners, um, how, how is you, how have you as a, as a reader and a coach and a practitioner, utilize these strategies in kind of your daily work? Yeah. So I, uh, work with middle school and high school kids primarily, and then also some, some adult, uh, fitness groups outside of doing my own coaching consulting business. So Monday through Thursday, when I'm working with the kids, probably the biggest thing is, is I've, I've really kind of stepped back and there was some, uh, great points you made kind of later in the book where you talked about, you know, if you, if you give a little, you, you get a lot in return. Um, so for example, like knowing that if, if the kids are coming in and, and they're um, kind of laughing and joking around and, and they want to do something that's not necessarily on the sheet, like I get a lot more, you know, buy-in and trust from them if I let them have a little bit more fun. Right. Yeah. You know, um, so I think that's, that's kind of the, one of the biggest things. And then also starting to realize that there's, there's some of those personalities, like, especially with some of the younger kids, they like to, to joke around and laugh and stuff. And then some are a little bit more serious. Uh, so it really, it really depends on if they're, you know, middle school or high school. Sure. Yeah, no doubt. Well, that's all. I mean, cause that's really where a lot of this is going. We're in the midst of creating a certification for this, right? Because a lot of coaches, and yeah, I'm not the biggest certification fan. I think there's a lot of ones out there that are not uh, don't probably have the the attendees in mind as much as they do just trying to make money. Uh, but, you know, traveling to different gyms or, or performance facilities, a lot of what I've heard is, hey, I have very intelligent coaches when it comes to training, but it is awful to when it comes to their social interaction and, and learning how to break down barriers and certain jump off points or what have you. And so We've had a lot of folks ask about that. So hearing how people like yourself have utilized certain information and, and certain pieces and also areas where you struggle uh, are big because we're going to build that out in the certification process. Yeah, I think that's fantastic. I mean, we're in, you know, our, our profession is coaching, but we're in the, the service industry and it's it's all about relationships. Right. So, you know, the more that you can really connect you know, at a, a, an emotional touch point with, um, you know, your student athlete or, or your client that you're working with. I mean, that's huge. Um, so the, the book's been really helpful for me and I continue to use those things. Um, so my question for you was without naming names or anything, what, what's been the most challenging archetype that you've had to coach? And then what was the most fun? Uh, I mean, I always, they're, they're two in the same. My favorite archetype to work with and um, the, my favorite one to coach is definitely the Wolverine. Uh, they're just a little bit the most, they're the more difficult in the beginning to kind of crack, but they're the most loyal once you've kind of earned their trust and, and, and really been able to show them that, not that you can relate because, you know, you're not going to be able to relate to all of your athletes. It's just not 
a reality. And I wouldn't even say that you want to try to relate to them. There are people that have lost both parents to gang violence. Like you trying to relate to them by saying, yeah, one time I lost a family member like that. Just that doesn't ingratiate you to them. That that's offensive. Right. So, uh, but once you've been able to break down some of the barriers and build their trust, they, uh, I like that challenge that, you know, I, I, I still like the challenge of getting people stronger, faster, all that, but, um, from a social standpoint and psychological standpoint, difficult athletes have kind of become a calling card for me. That's awesome. So you've, uh, you, you've really kind of been obviously taking some of the things that you've learned and put it into the book and the course, but, um, you know, how, how has working with some of these challenging athletes, like how has that continued to make you grow as a coach and a person? Right. Yeah. I mean, and, and that's, a, that's a, you're right. That's a big reason why we made the course. Cause I share a lot of those stories and, and kind of tactics and learning uh, points, but I mean, it just makes me continue to always reevaluate my approach. You know, I always go in and just like I said in my Instagram post today, I go back and at the end of a session, sit there and, and say, okay, how did, how did the pre-brief take place? How did I, what did I touch on on the debrief? How did I, um, how did I speak to certain things that they cared about? What was my uh, breakdown of use of analogies, metaphors versus more technical instruction. So I always go back and look at those aspects. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. So next, uh, next question I have for you on page 220, you talk about 13 coaching mistakes to avoid. So in your opinion, which mistakes do you see younger coaches continue to make more, more often? The first one is just not seeking to understand, you know, and, and I worded these a lot differently in the, in the book and, and, but the concept is just simple and I'm speaking to it in relative terms. So if people haven't read the book, they're not confused, but you know, people not just listening, you know, coaches love to instruct and educate. Uh, sometimes you just need to shut up and, and let the athlete kind of lead the way with those things. Um, you know, so that's a big one, you know, being able to really look and, and analyze your own bias uh, because again, everything that you see and the judgments that you make are are a reflection really of your experiences. And it's very easy for us to fit people into categories or a shoebox and and lead with those kinds of uh, uh, efforts instead of really seeing things as they are. Two, just you know, or three, really just being patient too. You know, you can't rush the process. And in the book, I you know I talk about results over rhetoric. So many coaches try to establish their credibility so quickly. And I think that's a tremendous mistake. You know, that trust is a two way street and a process that's built over time. So no, no telling them your degrees and, and using big fancy terms and all that is not going to, again, ingratiate you to the athlete. It's actually going to make them understand or or be evident to them that you're trying to compensate. So I just think being patient, there's a reason that the best food cooks, best tasting food cooks the most slowly. And uh, you got to you got to focus on that. Love it. That's great. What were some mistakes you made early in your career or even now? What are some things that you find that you continue to really go back and, and you struggle with and you have to be mindful of every day? Yeah. So definitely when I was um, younger, for sure, I would say that I was not patient enough. Um, I was not always the best listener. Um, I definitely tried to emulate probably a little bit too much some of the coaches that I had and I and I – as I got older, I realized I really needed to find my own voice um, and just be myself, you know. Yeah. Um, so that was probably one of the biggest things. Um, and then I think also, you know, I think w when I was first starting out, I would have the tendency to actually probably talk way too much, you know. And now I sort of pick my points, make make my my points, get everybody together. You know, at the beginning of the session, if I need to make a coaching cue or technical point, I wait till a set set's done or something and then pull everybody aside and do it. Great information, especially the, the emulating other coaches. I think that's one of the most common things people do, you know, definitely. And it, it's hard because today's coach, you know, there's so much information <laughs> out there that, you know, they don't know they always find themselves on one end of the other of the spectrum, you know, and so they're going to look at who they perceive to be successful and they want to mimic that, you know, and so it's really critical. And that's why I think, you know, the best coaches have always gone through something themselves. Uh, when you've gone through something and you had to look yourself in the eye and understand kind of who you are and what you're about in a real, in a real situation, uh, you know, where, where the risk is a bit higher 
and, and the consequences are a little bit greater. That's, that's a key piece. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I, I pulled a quote you had, uh, on Twitter on, uh, May 1st, right? So it was training great athletes does not automatically make you a great coach. Too many undervalue working with novices, youth, and those that are challenged in a myriad of other ways. True experience comes from exposure that is multifaceted. So one, I love that quote because, um, you know, I guess I, I feel sometimes or, or, you know, the medial dis- display that it, it seems that kind of the, the, the end goal is to be working with professional athletes. Right. And I thought that was a great point to make that you, you can gain tremendous experiences working with, um, you know, middle school, high school kids or college kids or, um, you know, individuals that might be, like you said, challenged, whether that's, you know, somebody that has a learning disability or special needs, or, um, you know, they are working back from a rehabilitation through an injury, like any of those things are really going to kind of, you know, test you and and challenge you as a coach. Yeah, no, spot on. And it's, it's good to hear you say that, but yeah, and it goes hand in hand again with a post that I put up on, on Instagram the other day, just, you can't specialize too early. Um, you know, even though I work primarily with pro athletes now, like I hold, uh, the time I spent with youth athletes and high school athletes, very, very, very dear, and I'll still work with them. Uh, but that was a tremendous learning, learning point for me. And I, it's harder to coach kids in many respects than it is professional athletes. You know, their, their motor sequencing and, and motor programming and, and motor skill development just isn't very robust. Uh, they also, you know, don't have the context and years of experience and, and myelination and certain movement patterns and, and all those things to, to build off of a lot of times pro athletes, you have to clean those things up, you know, where the difference is, is at, what I learned is it's harder to teach children or youth athletes more of the technical aspects for all the motor learning reasons I just elaborated on. Uh, when you get to the pro level, you've still got to touch on those things because a lot of that learning doesn't take place anymore. Um, a lot of them just get really into their position or their sport. Uh, but the psychological process becomes a different piece there. And that's when I really started deep diving into this is that was the animal you need to master when you're working with athletes at that level. Um, and, and certainly both levels, but childhood development, you know, is a very interesting thing psychologically. And uh, yeah, we need more coaches at the high school level, middle school level and youth level really to, to set the stage for success in the future. Awesome. I love it. I love it. Well, that's great to hear coming from you. Um, you know, I feel very blessed to be doing what I'm doing because uh, the kids, they, you know, they always keep it light. They make you laugh every day and smile. And you remember, <laughs> you remember not to take yourself too seriously when they're. Yeah, got it. That's a big, and that's one of the, that's one of the things you talk about in the course. You know, you have to understand how to laugh at yourself and, and not take things too seriously. It's easy too. That's so cool. Very cool. Um, so coming full circle, bring it back to the course. So how, how, how is this course different than anything that's currently out there? Um, and in your opinion, how is it going to help transform, um, an individual's coaching ability? Sure. Uh, hey, first and foremost, there is no other co- course on the science behind the art of coaching or even the art of coaching out there in general, right? There's nothing out there for strength coaches on this. Um, so, you know, there's, there's, Joel Jamison's got a great course on, on energy system development. You know, you got guys like Eric Cressy who do great work with, with, with the shoulder. You got plenty of other coaches that put out training related pieces. This is the first and only coaching course available that really focuses on the psychology and sociology of coaching development and, and interpersonal communication skills. Um, so right now we like to think that that speaks for itself. You know, it's interesting that, you know, people forget that training, the, the technical aspect is only 50% of our job. Right. So uh, the other percent of it is the communication, the logistical management and, and, and all those pieces, you know. And uh, so you look at that and the goal for me is to help the industry in whatever way I can round out coach development. I know I didn't have a mentor that was with me uh, the majority of my career. Still don't. Now, of course, I've learned from a lot of different people, but nobody ever was that hand on my shoulder uh, by my side for, you know, what's going into my 12th year of coaching. So, you know, to provide a resource that can perhaps be that for other people and help them learn uh, is a big is a big goal for us. That's awesome, man. <coughs> Sounds like you guys are off to a very good start. 
with the book and the course. So appreciate it. Yeah. yeah. Things keep building momentum. Um, so that, that took us through all the questions, uh, that, that you and I had down. Um, is there anything, uh, kind of else in particular you feel you want to touch on in regards to the course of the book that, that people may not know that they should know? Well, I think just coaching in general, and you touch on a key point, you know, and this coaching is educating. So whether you're a physical therapist listening to this, a personal trainer, a strength coach, a teacher, I mean, all these things apply, you know, and that's been one of the unique things about the course is seeing who enters it. I mean, we have lawyers, doctors, firefighters, um, middle, we have a middle, a couple of middle school teachers, athletic directors, sport coaches, strength coaches. Um, so that's been really unique. And it also tells you something, you know, and, and, in a technology focused world right now, we're starving for understanding how to communicate better and in a more meaningful way. I think the big thing to take away is this course isn't fluff. You know, you're not, it's, this is very anti, we are the world, you know, come together and just be positive and things fall into place. This dives into some of the nasty stuff that we don't want to admit we struggle with and fail with, you know, and, and that's what we're finding. That's been the number one feedback is coaches saying, hey, this really helped with things that I'm oftentimes too embarrassed to talk about. Uh, or I feel nervous that if, if somebody knew that I was struggling with this, they'd think I wasn't skilled enough or that I shouldn't be in the position I am. And that's not the case. You know, if, if communication wasn't a tough thing to manage, we wouldn't see kind of marriage and divorce rates what they are. You know, we wouldn't see uh, we wouldn't go through so many issues that we all have day to day communicating and interacting with colleagues and and people like that. So. Um, I think this is where the field is going. All these fields are going within the next 10 years. I think that, you know, technology will always be there humming in the background. But at the end of the day, if you work with people, you got to know how to connect. Love it. I love it. Um, that's fantastic. So we're through the questions. We got some time left. You have for some rapid fire questions. Sure. Cool. All right. So given all of your personal experiences and the knowledge you've accumulated, if you go back in time, what advice would you give yourself 10 years ago? Now, that one, I'm going to disappoint you because I actually created a whole free ebook on that at my personal website, like literally 54 pages because I get asked that a lot. Wow. No, no way I can encapsulate that. But if people just go to brettbartholomew.net, uh, it'll pop up in the free resources section. Uh, it's advice to be a better coach. So that's I'm, I'm going to leave you hanging on that one just because I wouldn't be able to do the answer justice. And that took me a long time to really sit down and write because, uh, you know, I, I just found that so many coaches would reach out with DMs and, and, and emails on that, that I had to do something that was a bit more scalable to kind of share that. Right. Because, as you know, there's so many podcasts out there. There's so many. In, and so I'd always think like, OK, I've answered this question or I've helped people. And uh, it's you find that, you know, no matter how many podcasts you do, there's always somebody that hasn't listened to any of them or hasn't even read the book. So I think that'll be a, hopefully a helpful resource. And that'll be, that'll be in the show notes. Um, okay. What's your personal favorite strength training exercise? Uh, squat or deadlift for sure. I'm from the Midwest. So I just like things where you, I'm a big lower body guy. Like I love that. And so I'd say if I had to pick one today, it would be deadlift. Awesome. How has your training changed today compared to 10 years ago? Like um, yourself? Yeah, I think I think the problem is, is to some degree it hasn't. You know, I still act like when I was a collegiate strength and conditioning coach, um, you always kind of had it in the back of your head. It wasn't uncommon for like if you met a strength coach for another school, you guys would lift together and it was always some kind of competition. It would always evolve into that. Um, <clears throat> I still kind of have that mindset, but I'm competing with myself now. And so uh, sometimes I don't like to admit that I can't recover as well as I used to. So you know, in the past when all I did was coach, you know, and run groups on the floor and all that, no problem. I mean, day to day, my jobs were to program, to lead my sessions, and then I would train, right? That, that was basically all I had to focus on. Now as an author, a coach, an adjunct professor, and a business owner, you know, I, I have stress coming at me from all angles. And I'm very sympathetically nervous system driven. Um, so it's not uncommon on even days like today where I coach, I have a podcast, you know, I have some programming to do um, that. It, it usually dramatically affects my numbers and things like that in the, in, uh, in the weight room. So I think now I'm better at auto regulating where in the past, like even if I didn't feel up to snuff, I'd make myself go do a, a near max effort, you know, training session or what have you. Um, now I'm a little better at, at knowing when and where to pick my spots. 
I still struggle with it, you know, but because uh, I always just want to push, push, push. And mm-hmm. traveling too, last year I took 102 flights, <clears throat> 101 or 102 flights. And so traveling, since you never know when you're going to get a training session in, you know, I tend to I tend to go as hard as I can when I am home. Wow. Wow. Yeah, that's a lot of different variables uh, adding adding some stress to uh, to the mind and body there. Yeah, so I think I've gotten a lot better. I mean, tips I'd give people, you know, the the twenty year old strength coach listening to this isn't going to care. But you know, once you get to a certain age and, and you've got to manage that recovery better, and it's setting boundaries. So you didn't ask this question, but um, one of the areas I've gotten better at is setting clear boundaries. Like your, I will probably do two more podcasts if that this year. That's it. And uh, wow. okay. yeah, uh, just because like last year was a big learning experience for me. You know, since I'm a self-published author. I didn't have any help marketing the book. I didn't do, you know, and so once the book took off like it did and the book's really only been out less than a year and a half, um, you know, I was like, oh, I got to get the word out. So I probably did. I, I mean, I can't even count how many podcasts last year. And I started realizing like, holy crap, like this really, as you know, right, because you, you have your own show. It takes a lot of time. And so you do a podcast or then somebody would reach out and say, Hey, do you want to have coffee? Do you want to do this? And you'd go meet for that. And then you'd get to the end of the day and be like, I have gotten nothing done, you know, and and I'm self-employed. So not only does that take a financial toll, um, you know, which I have a wife to provide for, you know, and and stuff like that too. But I would just drain myself by being a yes man. So I do every podcast that reached out, I'd I'd meet up with it. And now it's like, I certainly not that I'm big time by any means, but it's just I've learned to set limits, you know, and so I usually only do podcasts now on Fridays. Um, and, and that's because I have learned to bucket my time from people far more successful than I am to say, hey, you've got to set boundaries. Otherwise, I'll tell I'll tell your audience this. Nobody will respect your time like you, you know, and so if you're a yes man and or a yes woman, I'm using that as a kind of a colloquialism. So yes, man, yes, woman. I want to make sure and stipulate that. Um, but uh you, you've got to set boundaries on your time. It's a resource that doesn't get put back in the bank account. Love it. That's great advice. And I will be taking that to heart and trying to do a better job myself after hearing you share. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's hard, right? It's something that you continue to learn because you want to help people. You want to please people. And, and I think that's a lot of what read, led to me doing the course and the book is, I, I, you know, there's sometimes now where I have to tell people and I'm sure some people will hate me for it. Hey, I'm sorry. I can't meet you for coffee. Um, I do have a course and I have a book out. It's got 10 plus hours and 300 pages of information in it. I'm happy to meet sometime in the future, but right now I'm just really strapped. You know, the the problem with our field is unfortunately you're always going to get some people that then think, Oh, you couldn't make time for me and this and that, but I've just learned you can't make everybody happy. Otherwise you're, you're really going to detract from work that can help far more people. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, Awesome. Have you ever had an injury? And if so, how did that affect your training? Oh yeah, plenty. I mean, as a, I, I had my first injury at 14 year, 14 or 15 years old, tore my labrum, baseball pitching. Uh, I mean, I, I threw damn near every game, 80 games in 80 days. I was a left-handed pitcher. I mean, of course at like 14, 15, you have no idea how to train. Um, so tore my labrum. Uh, I boxed competitively in college and had a sports hernia from all the rotation. Uh, sports hernias are, are fairly common in soccer, hockey, and and rotational based sports. And some people are just genetically born with uh, a certain weakness in the abdominal wall that, 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 that force can take control on over time. And so I had a sports hernia there that I had to get recover, uh, repaired. Um, and then two years ago, I had a microdiscectomy. I had had back issues my whole life. Uh, I'd love to tell you, it was like, I was squatting 650 pounds while biting the head off a snake. Um, and I herniated it, but really I just, I've always had back issues. Um, every now and then my back would kind of go out, you know, and, and my dad's got real bad degenerative disc disease. So um, I had a back injury two years ago and it hasn't really changed it all that much. Again, just auto regulate smart now, you know, like I know when it, when it makes sense to go above 450 pounds on a deadlift and when I'm probably good for the day. Um, and I also know that when I'm getting off of a plane, I don't squat or deadlift that same day. So, you know, just smarter about those things. Awesome. Awesome. Um, in your opinion, what's one thing that high school athletes should be doing more of to complement their training and their health? Eating. Like actual eating, not like Taco Bell and, and what have you. High school kids don't understand that nutrition can make a good athlete great or a great athlete good. Um, and they think just because they ate a whole pizza at lunch that they are getting their calories in. 
um, not the case. You know, the human body needs, depending on size, weight, you know, and, and some other factors, anywhere from 1,000 to 1,800 calories a day just to just to survive. Mm-hmm. If you were in a coma today, what anywhere from 1,000 to 18, and again, big range because I'm talking male, women, men, women, different somatotypes, all those kinds of things. Um, but a lot of, uh, you know, how many times have you seen a high school kid be like, yeah, I ate. I ate a pizza at lunch and had a, you know, this and that, and you calculate it out and you're like, dude, you basically had 1800 calories today, but they think cause they'd eaten a lot at one sitting that they're eating a ton, you know? And so consistent eating habits is, is critical, are critical. Right. Um, we've talked a lot about sociology and psychology. What do you think is the most important mental factor for an athlete to be successful in their sport? Self-awareness. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. Uh, best tip to improve recovery after a training session? Uh, I mean, hydrate and fuel. Simple. You know, I, I think people forget that the best three supplements are still sleep, good nutrition, and smart training. You know, if, if you don't have those things taken care of, you know, that's, that's an issue. So I think people just have to make sure that they fuel after training. I mean, I, I, a lot of people get hung up on what do I do? You know, generally a three to one ratio of carbohydrates to protein two to one if you have some weight to lose or you have weight management issues, um, but just fuel, you know, and then sleep. I mean, how much data do we need now in the world to show us that we're, we're not sleeping enough, you know? And so I think those are two critical pieces there. How about you? Uh, really sleep for me. Yeah. Yeah. That's a big one. How many hours do you get? Um, I try to get at least seven to eight. Yeah. But- how many do you actually get? Probably six. Right. And that's more common for, for the vast majority of us. So yeah. uh, those things I think are critical. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Brett, that takes us through everything. Well, I appreciate your time. Great question, man. Very, th- uh, very uh, thought provoking. Give me some good insight too, as we continue to develop more. So keep the feedback coming. If you wouldn't mind, send me this question list. I thought you asked phenomenal questions and they're good things for me to reflect on and, and continually challenge myself on. So if you wouldn't mind, I'd appreciate it. Sure. Will do. Thanks so much, Brett. Yeah. Take care, Joe. Bye. Thanks for listening to the Leo Training Podcast. Subscribe and get even more expert training tips at www.leotraining.io.